Hey there, thanks so much for tuning in to Mission Church Online. Our hope and prayer is that this message would help you in your journey in finding and following Christ. We love that you're tuning in online, but we would absolutely love to meet you here at 82 Stratford Drive. We've got services on Saturday and Sunday and something for every age and stage. So we would love to get to welcome you here at Mission. But for today, let's dive in to this message. Psalm 23. Everyone say Psalm 23. Psalm 23, perhaps the most famous passage in all of the Bible. Psalm 23, this chapter is incredible, and we've been learning so much about it. And if you're new for the first time today, uh, this might weird you out a little bit, but uh, this is how we're going to get started. So raise your left hand and right hand. We've been doing this every single week to help us memorize the first five words of Psalm 23. Here we go. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, This is what we'll be doing. What an easy way for you to remember uh, the first five words of Psalm 23, because these first five words really set the trajectory for the rest of the psalm. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, meaning Yahweh, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who is beyond. Yahweh, the one that is majestic, the one that is all-powerful. David is writing this song to God, and he's saying, the Lord is my. That his God and our God that is beyond and all-powerful is also personal. He knows me by name. And David says, he's my shepherd. What an incredible word picture that we have for Psalm 23. That God, Yahweh, he is the shepherd of our soul. And so we're understanding a lot about shepherds and sheep. This shepherd and sheep word picture sets the context for all of Psalm 23. Now, last week we got to verse 4. And verse 4 is probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible. That and John 3.16, probably those two. And what we looked at last week in verse 4 was part A. Today we're going to look at part B. But let me first read to you part A. This is what we looked at last week. David writes, Even though I walk, say it with me, through the what? Through Through the valley of the shadow of death. We are valley walkers. This is life on earth. We walk through valleys. We're leaving the low country. We're heading to the high country. And as we move towards the high country with our shepherd, we move through the canyons of life. Dark places, scary places, difficult places. And David is saying, these valleys we don't run through, no, we walk through. Many of you are walking through a valley right now. And what I wanted to do is draw your attention to three great books. You could screenshot this real quick. Uh, this, these three books have helped me. I believe they can help you. Great books from uh, Disappointment with God to Tim Keller's incredible book here in the middle. And a friend of ours, Aubrey Sampson, The Louder Song, she actually launched that book from this stage a few years back. What, what great resources for those of you or your loved ones that are walking through a valley. David is saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he continues, he says, listen, I will fear no evil. I will not be overcome by this evil. No, why? You are with me. Even though I feel afraid, fear will not triumph over my life. Fear will not cause me to turn around and head back down. No, he's saying, I will not be afraid, right? I'm not going to be overcome with this. Why? God is with me. And so this is where we finished last week. We hold on in prayer and we let go in trust. That's what we talked about last week. Well, that's part A of verse 4. Today we're going to look at part B. And it's so important to understand what we're going to talk about today because we're going to see why David was not overcome by fear even in the valley. We will see the why of why, even in the valley, fear did not triumph over David's life. Uh, Part B really gets to this. This is what what David writes. Check this out. Uh, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is what we're going to study today. Say it with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, it's important to notice um, that David is not saying, in the valley, I'm comfortable because of your rod and staff. That's not reality. You will not ever become comfortable in the valley, but we can be comforted in the valley. And the way that you and I are comforted in the valley is by understanding what is in the left hand and the right hand of our shepherd. Oftentimes we just skip past this and think that maybe the rod and the staff are like parallelism for saying the same thing, but they're not. When we understand shepherding, we understand that they would carry these two tools that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the staff for about 30 seconds, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time on the rod, the staff, symbolic for leadership. 
uh, the staff in the left hand of the shepherd, uh, just kind of picture the kind of crooked top. This was the staff of the shepherd, and the shepherd would use that long staff to apply pressure to the sides of the sheep, helping to guide them forward. If they got lost, he'd use that crooked part to perhaps even pull them out. He's saying, I'm comforted in the valley because in the left hand is a staff, but in the right hand is a rod. We're going to talk about the rod. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon on the rod before. I've never given a sermon on the rod before, and truthfully, I've never really in-depthly looked into this until this past week, and I'm so excited to talk to you about the rod. You're going to understand why David experienced comfort in the valley. It was because of the power of God. As the staff is symbolic for leadership, the rod is symbolic for power. The rod is symbolic for power. Say that with me. The rod is symbolic for, for power. All right, everyone go like this. Come on, get your flex on. Some of you have been looking for this opportunity, all right? <laughs> symbolic for power. This is what David is saying. That in the valley, my shepherd is all powerful and he's with me. Therefore, fear is not going to triumph over me. Because in the right hand of my shepherd is the rod. It's the rod. And so it begs the question as we get started, whose power am I relying on really? Whose power are you relying on really? Now, I have this reflex that I've been working on for a very long time. But in the valley, valley moments, I've experienced tons of them. And sometimes they're seasoned and sometimes it's for like an hour on Wednesday afternoon. You can experience the valley in a lot of different ways. My reflex oftentimes is to uh, trust in my power. Now, I know you can't relate to this, but that's my reflex. Uh, It's definitely Tommy's reflex as well. And and so we put some artwork up on the wall when we opened this building uh, five years ago. And it's of our church's really kind of anchor verse from Zechariah 4, 6, meaning not by my or by power, not by my might or by my power, no, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And so this is really this incredible verse that we come back to over and over again because oftentimes in the valley, I trust in my own power. And when I'm trusting in my own power in the valley, I am not comforted. Why? Because I am owned in fear. Because I'm actually being the shepherd in the valley. And yet David is saying, no, 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 here's what we need to do in the valley. We need to understand that our shepherd has a staff and he has a rod and he knows what to do with them. The rod, symbolic for power. The shepherd would have this four-foot rod club with them. David was once a shepherd before he became a king. He killed a lion and a bear, in my opinion, not with the slingshot, but with the rod. Hand-to-hand combat. The text says he grabbed it by the hair. That's when you use the rod and you smash in its skull. More on that in just a minute. All right, but here's what we're going to get to. I know, I'm pumped. Uh, The rod's power. All right, the rod's power. The rod's power was used for two things in the life of a sheep. Here's the first one. This one, I I had no idea until I studied this. Uh, The rod's power to search. This is really interesting. The rod's power, say with me, to what? To, To search. The rod's power, the shepherd would use this rod to search the sheep. Sheep have wool um, and what is what he's saying here is in the valley especially things grow. There's threats and those threats can be exterior. We'll get to that in a minute but there's also interior threats and so the shepherd would use the rod to pull back the wool of the sheep to see Is there anything growing on the sheep? Is there any kind of irritation on its skin? Is there anything latching on to the sheep that should not be latching on to the sheep? This is what the shepherd would do. W. Philip Keller says it this way. In caring for his sheep, the good shepherd, the careful manager, will from time to time make a careful examination of each individual sheep. As each animal comes out of the corral and through the gate, it's stopped by the shepherd's outstretched rod. This is a most searching process, entailing every intimate detail. It is to a comfort to the sheep, for only in this way can its hidden problems, its hidden problems, be laid bare before the shepherd. Now, in the valley, we are vulnerable. We are especially and uniquely vulnerable in the valley. And this is why the shepherd, he uses the rod, his power, to pull things back to search your life. Uh, I, I've got a hunting dog named Jack, and I've showed you so many pictures of him over the years. He's my duck dog. He's amazing. He chases down pheasants, and I could, 
I got to stay focused because I can keep talking about that. But I take him on walks every day, and uh, we're out walking in the woods, and he swims in the creek. Don't tell Kelly, but that's how he bathes. And, and then we get back to the house, especially in the months of May and June, and I kind of get him down on the ground, and he doesn't like that. But then I do something for his own good, which is I begin to search his skin looking for ticks. Sometimes the greatest threats in your life are not the overt, obvious, huge, scary threats out there. They're the covert threats like pride and envy or comparison. And in the valley, we're vulnerable. In the valley, you know that's where things grow. Good things grow in the valley like belief, but also bitterness. Good things grow in the valley like faith, but also doubt. Good things like integrity, but also indifference. Good things like humility, but also resentment. The shepherd, what's he doing? He's using the rod to pull things back to examine your life. He's looking at the threats that are in here. He's looking at the things that can take your life out. He's looking at the things that no one else can see but him. He's searching us. He's searching us. The question is, are we welcoming this or resisting it? Are we welcoming his searching power in our life? And David says this in Psalm 139. Uh, this, is, this is what spiritual maturity sounds like. This is what it sounds like when we have lived long enough and we've been searched thoroughly enough by God to know that he searches us for our own good. So David writes this. He says, search me. Oftentimes, we're like, search my spouse. Nope, David's like, search me. <laughs> search my student. <laughs> well, yeah, we'd like them to do that too, but we're going to start with this guy. Search me. Know my heart. This is a dangerous prayer. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. He's saying to his shepherds, see if there's any offensive way in me. When was the last time? sitting in your chair, cup of coffee, on a walk, on a run, wherever, you prayed this kind of prayer to God, to your shepherd, saying, hey, start with me. Search me. God, I know you love me. I know you can see into every nook and cranny of my life. You're my shepherd, and you want to pull things back, and you want to search to see if there's any kind of interior threat in my life. Search me. God, would you search me? Would you test me? Would you look? Would you know my anxious thoughts? Would you see, is there any offensive way in me? And then lead me in the way everlasting. Would we, as followers of Jesus Christ, begin to pray like this? Would we understand that in the right hand of our shepherd is a rod and it is powerful for our own good? To fight off the threats out there, but it starts in here, the threats, the interior threats of the heart that can take us out. The rod's power to search. Secondly, the rod's power to save. If you're taking notes, these are the two ways that the power is experienced in the life of a sheep. It's the, the rod's power to search our life, but also to save our life. We're vulnerable in the valley. We are vulnerable to these inside threats, but also these outside threats. And as David is saying, the sheep are following their shepherd and they move through the canyons. And this is where predators would hide out. This is where wild kind of animals would come in to try to take out the sheep. But David is saying, as that's happening in my life, I'm not overcome by fear because in the right hand of my shepherd is a rod and he knows what to do with it. My shepherd is armed and very dangerous. This is the John Peacock translation. He has this four-foot club and it is stained in blood. Now, we're about to not be very suburban for the next couple minutes. Is that okay? Because to really understand Psalm 23, verse 4, part B, you got to understand that dripping from the club, from the rod of the shepherd, is blood. Why? It was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat to protect the sheep. That when a wolf would come in, out would come the rod, and it would literally smash in the skull of a predator. There's a few of you that are like, man, I like this sermon. Some of you are a little worried. Well, there is an enemy that has one plan. It is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. If he can't steal your salvation, which he can't, he's going to try to render your life powerless. 
He's going to try to induce you with fear. He's going to fill your mind with lies. He's going to try to separate you from your spouse. He's going to try to convince you as a high school student to have sex now. Why wait? This is what he does. And David is saying, in the valley, in the right hand of my shepherd is a rod. And I'm going to depend on the power of my shepherd even now. That he will crush the enemy when he comes in to attack. Our shepherd is armed and very dangerous. How do we experience, how do we access this power of God on our behalf? I want to draw your attention to Ephesians 6 verse 10. On Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning, when all of a sudden you are hurled into a valley experience through an email, through a text message from a client, a phone call from a daughter or son, this is how life actually happens. Sometimes that valley comes many times unannounced, and bam, here we are. We're now in the valley, and in that moment, instead of depending on uh, your strength, how do we actually depend on God's strength? How do we say, God, would you protect me right now? Well, Ephesians 6.10 really is one of the, the best ways that we can apply this. And God's Word says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I found this verse incredibly helpful. I've quoted, I memorized it a long time ago. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Priscilla Shire, she wrote a devotional a number of years ago called The Armor of God. I highly recommend it, really good. And she talks about this phrase, be strong in the Lord. And so I want to just teach you real quick the the verb tenses uh, behind this because it really unlocks the meaning and application of be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord is written in the present passive imperative tense. And so let's break that down real quick because you don't remember English class in high school. So the, the present tense means ongoing. Everyone say ongoing. Ongoing. So here's what this means. Be strong in the Lord. It's written in the present tense, meaning a day is not coming when you no longer need to be strong in the Lord. When you're with Christ in heaven, okay, then. But until then, like every single day, right? The enemy never takes a day off. Neither should we when it comes to being strong in the Lord. So it's in the present tense, meaning ongoing, but it's also in the passive imperative tense. Really interesting. Imperative means it's a command, not a suggestion. And it's a command not because God's powering up on us. It's a command because he wants to comfort you in the valley. This is why it's an imperative sense. It's for your own good. But it's also in the passive tense. This is so interesting. Uh, It was written about uh, this way. Check this out. The passive imperative is a command Right? Directed to you in which you are what? Say it with me. You are? All right. Guys, your actual life, your real life, I'm telling you, if you will understand this, this is an absolute game changer for your life. I I want you to love God with your mind. Pay attention. Focus in on this. All right? The passive imperative is a command directed to you in which you are not the active doer, but rather the cooperator and recipient of someone else's doing. What? And yet, you still retain responsibility. Screenshot that. Spend time thinking about that this week. Be strong in the Lord. What does this mean? It means in the valley, it is your responsibility to remain in Christ. It is your responsibility to trust in the Lord. It's your responsibility. No one else can do this for you. It also means, though, It's in the passive tense that it is not your strength that's going to get you through. It is not you bowing up, saying yesterday was leg day. Come on, what you got, Satan? I've been training for this. No, no, no. (laughs) You will get owned in the valley. This has nothing to do with your strength. That's, That's when defeat comes. That's when despair and that's when anxiety soars. No, this means that you are depending on the very power of God. And I'm telling you, the opportunity is typically in the valley when we learn how to do this. We learn in the valley. It is our responsibility, but it is not our power. It is our responsibility, but it is not our power. How are we comforted in the valley? It is by depending on the very power of God. It is believing that in his right hand is the rod, and that is the rod of power to protect your life. And we depend on it. We trust in it. Whose power are you relying on really? David says it this way in Psalm 68, another one of my favorite psalms. He says, may God arise. David was a man that was used to conflict. 
People came after him. It's part of how leadership is, but it's definitely how following God is. He was very used to having to be on the run, people coming after his own life, family dysfunction, his own son going after the crown. And he's saying, let God arise. May his enemies be scattered. His name is what? Say it with me. His name is the, there it is again, the God of all caps, Yahweh. Check this out. A father to the fatherless. You felt unfathered your whole life. And in the valley, it opens up that father wound, doesn't it? In the valley, you're like, no, 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 it's, it's up to me. It's always been up to me. Well, David says he's a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of widows. Man, I think about single parents and the depth of vulnerability that you feel. He's your defender. Our God is a God who saves. And then we're about to go William Wallace. I love this part. Surely God will what? Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies. Summon your power. God, show us your strength. Our God, as you have done before, the God of Israel gives power and strength. To who? To his people. Are you in his family? Have you surrendered your knee to Jesus being adopted into the family of God, sitting around the very table of God. You get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. More on that Easter weekend. Power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Now, the linchpin of this whole teaching, I believe, is when you close your eyes and you think about your good shepherd, what image comes to mind? I believe that many of you, you're caving in the valley, you're overwhelmed by fear in the valley, because the image that you have of your good shepherd in the valley, it's anti-biblical, but it's this image that you have of who Jesus actually is. And I brought a picture of the image that many of you have of Jesus in the valley. I call him Malibu Jesus. <laughs> Holding a lamb. He just got done with a yoga sesh. <laughs> um, what? Guys, what's he going to do for you in the valley? Let me answer. Nothing. So you should be afraid. If that's your, if that's your understanding, because you haven't read all the Bible, if that's your understanding of who Jesus is, you should be terrified in the valley. 2015, I went on a trip to Africa. And we landed in Nairobi, and we were there for a couple days, and then we got onto a little prop plane, tiny, tiny little plane. And it was awesome. I was pretty much like on the pilot's lap. I mean, I was, I could see, it was really fun. I could see all the controls and looking out the wind, windshield and um, talk to the pilot the whole flight. And we flew for a little more than an hour on this little prop plane into the middle of the Maasai Mar. Um, you've probably seen pictures of the Great Migration, National Geographic, of like, all these animals migrating every year. You've seen these river moments where like all of a sudden like an animal gets eaten by a crocodile. That's where I went. And it was awesome. And we land on this dirt road in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And uh, some Jeeps picked us up and we began to kind of tour around out there. And we saw elephants and we saw some, uh, some lions, some female lions. And like we could also see these tents. And um, we... Uh, quickly began to realize that, oh, that's where we're staying, in these tents, like 300 yards from this lion. And they began to um, make it clear to us, they're like, you guys have probably noticed by now that there's no fences here. We're like, yeah, we, we've noticed. I kind of noticed most things. They're like, yeah, there's no fences. So not only small fences, but there was no even, there, there was no, nothing. And you're looking at the tent, and you're seeing those lions 300 yards away, and you're looking at the tent, and you're just like, this is going to be an interesting night. And uh, they said, we don't want you to be afraid because we have a security system. And um, they began to talk to us about the security system, and they, uh, they said, you'll be acquainted with the security system once you get to your tent. And so I made my way to my tent, and um, there I was greeted not with uh, software, but with an actual uh, warrior. 
the Maasai warriors, they are warrior shepherds. They are given that red covering once they kill a lion. They don't order that outfit on Amazon. And I, I knew all about this warrior tribe, and I'm like, wait, this is my security system tonight? And um, I began to uh, talk to my security system. Um, his one job was to stand guard over the mouth of my tent the whole night. That was his job. And uh, darkness was setting in. Darkest place I've ever seen in my life. Quietest place I've ever been to in my life. Um, down the ravine, just a couple steps outside of my tent, there's about a 20-foot ravine. That's where one of the rivers were. So many crocodiles. And uh, I was getting ready for bedtime. And I thought it would be responsible to just ask him some questions, check in on his resume. My wife did say, please come back alive. And so I'm just kind of asking him, like, you know, how long you been doing this? And um, uh, he begins to explain to me he's been doing this a while. And then I just kind of wanted to make sure that he'd had some experience. Because they told us animals come through, the, like, the campsite. I'm like, so, Mike, have you ever, like, has that ever happened? He's like, yeah, well, yeah, as if it was the dumbest question I could ever ask. <laughs> I'm like, have, have you ever seen any, like, hand-to-hand combat? He said, well, yes, of course. I said, recently? He said, well, yeah, not that long ago. Um, a cheetah came in. I'm like, a cheetah? <laughs> That's like a faster mountain lion. And uh, I said, and? He said, I killed it. And he showed me the, the rod. It's African club. He said, you know, he got me a little bit, showed me his scars. Here and here. This eye was a little cloudy, but I didn't ask. But he said, I took care of it. I said, okay, well, I'm just going to head to bed then. And I, <laughs> I go in my tent, and God is my witness. I'm in there, guys. I'm, I am trying to be so tough and brave. And I'm a total outdoorsman, but I, guys, I, am, I can hear things dying. I'm laying on my cot. I hear things dying. I'm like, I hope it's not my guard. I don't, I don't know what's dying, but I hear things dying out there. And so it's 2 in the morning. I'm like, I just got to make sure he's still out there. And I get up out of my bed, and I walk out there, and I just kind of unzip, and I just poke my head out, and he's there. And he just looks at me, and, I, and uh, he just gives me the look like, bro, get back in there. <laughs> so let me ask you, who do you want to guard the tent of your life? I'm going to give you two options. Here we go. You want, you want Malibu Jesus? who is nowhere to be found in the Bible? Or do you want the God of angel armies? Yahweh. The one who was and is to come. The one who is mighty to save. The one who is all powerful. The one who created you. David is saying, I'm not overwhelmed in the valley because I know who's standing guard over my life. He's the shepherd. He's armed and he's very dangerous for my good. You're given communion on the way in. I would love for you to take this out and just hold on to it. Ask the team to sing a song over us during this communion time. And I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want to invite you to pray a forward prayer today. Jesus, have it all. I have found these short prayers incredibly helpful. Jesus, have it all. Say that with me. Jesus, have it all. But when you're ready to pray that prayer today, then I want you to receive communion as they're singing this song over you. Because I know what happens in the valley. You begin to control, as do I. In a place of fear, we white-knuckle that relationship. We want to hold on to our kids as tight as we can, thinking that's good parenting, but it isn't. Jesus, have it all. That career, that opportunity, that relationship. Most importantly and most eternal, my heart. Have you, have you come to the place in your life where you have said, Jesus, have it all, like all of it, all of it. 
On Friday, I drove to St. Louis for my daughter's volleyball tournament, and my wife and two girls were with me, and we stopped in Bloomington Normal where I went to college. And I toured them around the college campus, and I showed them where me and my buddies lived and the stadium I played baseball in and a lot of other things. And I thought it would be important for them to see where Dad went to school, but it brought up so many different memories. of how much of a train wreck my life was in college. Where baseball was my God, sexual sin abounded. The wildest guy on campus, except when Tommy came to visit. (laughs) Broken, man. My own shepherd, afraid. And then I looked at my wife and my two girls. I'm like, this is the most incredible thing of how, for me, everything changed when I finally went all in. I was holding no more chips. Everything. Everything. It's yours. Starting with my heart. But everything, my body, the patterns of my life, my mind, my ambition, my dreams, it's yours. That's when it all changed. What are you waiting on? Why not now? Why not today? You know it's not working. What could happen today if you just say, Jesus, have it all? So today as you receive communion, today is going to be your day where you now have a shepherd who is Jesus Christ. Through simple faith in him, Jesus, have it all. God, we thank you that you meet us here You are not a rookie shepherd. You are seasoned. You've seen it all. And you see us. And you know where we're at. And you know what we're dealing with. And so right now, God, we are saying, have it all. Jesus, have it all. I can't keep carrying this. I can't keep trying to control that. And so as we take into our body the bread that represents the body of Christ, And the juice that represents the blood of Christ. We are are taking in communion by making a statement that the greatest threat that ever existed, the threat of sin and death, was crushed. As you, Jesus, were willingly crushed on our behalf. Forever saved. Holy Spirit, open the... Open the eyes of folks' hearts right now that they would understand the good news of your grace and mercy. God, I pray that some would be saved right now and that all of us would be saved yet again right now in the valley. We'd say, you know what? I'm done trying to control this. Jesus, have it all. As we take and receive communion, that's what we're saying. Jesus, have it all. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in to that message. Be sure to subscribe so that you can see more of our videos. And as always, we would love to see you here at 82 Stratford Drive on a Saturday or a Sunday. Until then, we'll see you next time.